we'll look at this uh, here in just a bit. So let's understand kind of where we've come from. So rates, I have two things here on this chart, very, very important for context as a, as a, as a starting base. We have a 10 year, a two year yield. So these are two year treasury uh, uh, note yields. And you can see we've come from 5% down to, again, as I'm recording this, uh, just a shy of, of four, actually closer to 3.9%. At the same time, this purple line here, has also moved down and tends to have a pretty good uh, uh, sort of tracking with yields. And that's the US dollar. So the US dollar has gotten punished as yields have come down because of course, as yields go down, uh, one will find more attractive yield opportunities elsewhere uh, if yields remain relatively higher somewhere else. So that's what's been going on. And, um, and you know, I think people are getting a little bit over, over their skis in terms of the wishful thinking of lower rates. Um, what I keep saying about this, and, and this is, it, I think, one of the more important points, I, even though I did say before, I'm not going to rank these important points, but I do think this is actually one of the most important. I think one thing that a lot of people tend to estimate it, underestimate at this point in the cycle is that if rates continue to drop at an accelerating rate, at some point, the equity market's going to freak out. I personally think the Fed is seeing something in the economy. Um, certainly the unemployment rates inching up, I think 50 basis points or so, something like that here or there. Um, so I think they're seeing something probably in the consumer is my guess, uh, cause they have a lot of data. And, and if you, you know, go back to the great financial crisis, uh, in hindsight that, uh, they have, uh, admitted that the fed and, uh, uh, and the treasury actually have a lot more data points that I think people believe that they have a look at, uh, even though they don't have a great track record of kind of leading us to soft landings, which is a whole nother point. But anyway, so I think just be mindful if you're an equity investor, at least certainly we are, and we are to our clients as well. Um, if rates continue to drop, I think, you know, two-year yields, less important than 10 years. So let's go to 10-year yields quickly. I think if 10-year yields drop much below 3.6, and, and again, if it happens quickly, I think that could be a point where equities don't like it much. Um, let's talk a little bit about... Uh, before we get to U.S. stocks and, and 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 stuff like that that I know everyone cares about, let's build a framework here within which we can we can work and kind of back out. One thing that was very concerning to me was the way in which we rebounded from that uh, volatility spike in early August. Uh, I'm showing you here the Nikkei because that is ultimately where a lot of the bouncing started. We had a sort of a mini flash crash, if you will, or I guess it was kind of a crash on August the 5th the Nikkei as the uh, yen basically started to uh, rally. So this is uh, what I'm showing here is a chart of the, of the dollar yen. So yen went down, uh, excuse me, yen went up, which meant the dollar went down. That's the same chart I, showed, I, I mentioned before. The dollar has been weak here, uh, certainly for the past uh, few months or so. And again, I think if rates collapse here further at an accelerating rate, uh, then the dollar would certainly probably remain somewhat weaker, but I think also equities would join. So if you if you kind of all bring all this together, I'm going to just quickly show everyone a chart here that brings all these things together. So I'm going to create a, a, a picture here of, of the 10-year yields. I'm going to add, just for fun, the dollar index. Actually, not just for fun. This is really important. And I'm also going to add equity. So let's add the S&P 500 here for uh, for a good measure and so uh, what i'm showing here now is a is basically a chart that that is most disconnected on the equity side um that does not mean that 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 yields uh have to uh, have have to go in a completely different direction but i think the equity market here is delusional as to where we likely are in the economic cycle and you know, this is evidenced by a lot of even, even institutional research that's that's good by my evaluation over many years. I think I feel like a lot of, of research uh, that's that's being sent out now on the professional side is really confused as to where we are in the cycle. And, and it, it is it has been a weird cycle because of COVID, because of all the money that's been thrown at it. And so, you know, people either think we're in the early part of an expansion or we're very late cycle. I happen to think we're in a late cycle. Um, but again, some people think we're completely somewhere different and that gets, gives us completely different uh, conclusions. But if this correlation here uh, were to hold true at all, meaning dollar lower, bond yields lower, then at some point the equity market will probably go lower as well, or at least not a lot higher. And even if only from a seasonal perspective. Um, 
So before I, I show you a seasonal chart that I've been showing around for the past uh, two and a half weeks or so, let me just quickly go back to that volatility point that I made before. You know, the VIX or more importantly, the VIX futures, I think are more, uh, more important here to watch more true. The VIX futures spiked up to, let's call it uh, the high 30s uh, in, uh, on August 5th and then basically went right back down towards 15. I don't think that's healthy. I think it's also a function of uh, algorithms basically that rule the, 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 the trading day these days. Um, they have no emotions. They will buy, you know, no questions asked based on what their signals are. And uh, I, I fear, I shouldn't say fear because I think it would be perfectly normal and it'd be healthy that the, that this VIX spike was not a one and done. We're going to see another one. And that is also one thing that we can now look at a seasonal chart for. And again, I've been showing this chart around. So if you've seen this before or heard about it from me, um, then this will be a good uh, sort of reminder. If, if, if you haven't seen it, then this may be a good first to look at as well. So basically what I'm looking at here or what I'm describing is a seasonal chart in election years, US election years. We're in the fourth year of a cycle here right now with the elections, of course, this year in early November. And basically what I see is the equity market, and I see this empirically as well, likely topping out here into early September and not bottoming out until either just after or maybe just before the, the election. Now, there's a reason for that, and it's not the chart. It's not just whatever. There's an actual reason as institutional investors tend to be reluctant, rightly so, to add a lot of fresh capital uh, to, to, in this case, the equity market ahead of an election. And that has nothing to do with politics necessarily in terms of the policies of who gets elected, but they don't like the uncertainty that comes with it. So once we're past that event, whatever the outcome, right? And 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 maybe that will not include an outcome of what some some people are saying there could be chaos on the streets. That's again, I don't I don't do politics, certainly not here. So that's not the point. The points of the markets, but that would be a, maybe a different. It, it, uh, sort of a, a, a situation, but even that at some point one would think will pass. So from an institutional investor's perspective, again, we're talking about an investment analysis here, not political analysis. Um, an institutional investor will like to, to add money to the markets again, and because they have to, they have inflows, right? A lot of them. Um, once the event is passed, regardless of the outcome, again, unless there's like a, like, you know, civil unrest in a meaningful way. And even then I think I would imagine again, no politics, purely from an investment perspective, they would be more prone to then add capital at some point because at least you know the event is passed, even though there may be in this in that sort of scenario there would be effects. So anyway, that's so it's just one way of looking at it from an institutional uh, perspective. Which brings me to a couple of things that I think you know is is where I see a lot of complacency. I think the in, in, the in, individual investor, the retail investor, has is very very complacent. In fact, as I'm recording this, there was a, a whole bunch more papers on uh, from investment banks that were published over the past few days that are basically echoing this. So that's nice to hear. Um, at the same time, and this is important, you know, if, if I look at our sector work, I look at our trend work, um, you know, basically all sectors are remaining in a bullish trend. So that includes financials. So this, I'm just using our market rover trend following uh, algorithm, which is really the, the, the cornerstone of our analysis. Uh, every single sector in the S and P 500 is in a bullish trend. Now, typically, of course, you know, <laughs> as it goes, that doesn't necessarily mean that an object in motion has to continue to be in motion. In that sense, at some point, it'll stop. And I do think that seasonality chart, that that election year seasonality chart that I showed you, I think there's a high likelihood of that coming to fruition. Now, the question, of course, is, and this is, I think, really gets to 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 the fundamental sort of thing here is what happens with big big cap tech. In fact, if we look and we rank the sector movement so far this year, and that's why I have this thing up here. So again, every sector right now is bullish, but I do think we could see a change in that. If I rank these sectors, and if you uh, are listening and you are a annual or lifetime member of the Market Rover, you have access to uh, this tool as well, where we can see that year to date, Best sectors are not tech, okay? It's financials, utilities, uh, communication stocks, because there's a couple of them in there, and basically consumer staples and healthcare. Technology is in like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, as I'm recording, it's in seventh place. Doing well, right? The XLK, which is the 
the tracker ETF for the S&P 500 um, technology sector is up almost 15% as I'm recording this, but financials are up 22, utilities are up 22 and change. Uh, Communications are up more than 20, right? That's a huge spread. If you think about it, that's 600 basis points or more in performance, meaning 6%. And so it really gets me to where are we in terms of some of these big big tech big tech stocks, uh, including and and maybe most prominently, let's let's understand where's Nvidia. Um, I'll just quickly mention this because again, I think a lot of people follow the stock, rightly so. Good company, a lot of growth, important stock here in this day and age. Um, but it's also important to understand that this is a this is a stock that has now gapped higher after earnings, I believe four out of the past five times. So uh, it gapped higher in the February 23 quarter. It gapped higher after earnings in the, notably in the May 23, uh, 20, May 23 uh, quarter. So reporting an, uh, earnings announcement. Then again, in February, the following year, meaning this year, and then again in May of this year, but it didn't gap higher on the earnings report that we uh, after the earnings report we just had here, uh, or just a few a few days ago, I guess we we could go something like that um, in 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 in, uh, in in late August. And so, typically speaking, the reason that ha- these upgaps happen is because analysts are are still underestimating the growth of the company, right? But at some point, after you know, typically after two and sometimes three upgaps, in this case, Nvidia had four, uh, but again, it's Nvidia, right? So. Uh, bit of a, its own beast just because of the chart chasing we have and everyone's very bullish the markets or everyone's you know this can exacerbate moves and also of course algorithms which which uh, which can really get these things moving um in this case the stock moved up it gapped up four out of five times because analysts were still too 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 sort of bearish but i think now they've they've a lot of analysts have caught up and the, and indeed the rate of growth the rate of growth, right, is slowing in NVIDIA. It's not a bad company. It doesn't mean one doesn't have to own it or short it. It just means that the rate of growth is slowing. And at some point, analysts, so it didn't, it wasn't able to surpass the highest analyst uh, uh, estimates, right? And that's maybe enough for this stock to be done going up for quite a while, right? And this is not a fundamental call necessarily, as much as it is a structural call. Uh, we know that everyone's long the stock in, you know, five ways to, to uh, in, in many ways, I should say, maybe too many ways, right? So this could also ultimately, speaking of algorithms, lead to algorithms start to become net sellers of things, and just like as they algorithms have been buying things on every single dip, they may start to sell things on every on every on every rally. So that's a possibility, um, but I don't know exactly. You know, obviously how how quickly they want to react is as I'm looking at right now. Nvidia is seeing a bit of pressure, but again, this is obviously not meant to be day trading uh, conversation here right now. What really concerns me much more, and this is a big focus uh, for us both at the, the over on the Steady Trader and also for our clients at Blue Marlin Advisor, that's bluemarlinadvisor.com, is really this whole notion that we strongly believe that hard assets, so that includes commodities, uh, certain commodities, not just any commodities, uh, particularly, you know, sort of things like copper and gold and silver, and 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 things like energy stocks and many things like that have an extremely high likelihood of outperforming high growth tech stocks, which would which basically means we have we're going to have a completely different environment uh, going forward. So I wanted to quickly end on this because this is to me probably the most important chart that I can or or discussion point that I can bring up, and it has a lot to do with where we're, where we are in terms of inflation and and how, why we think a lot of people have completely misallocated their portfolios or currently are allocated in portfolios that really are uh, a were great portfolios for the past 10 15 years but we think will be terrible portfolios going forward so just to give you a little bit of an idea and and this is again I'll, I'll take you take you just for a second through a bit of a history lesson of inflation in the United States going back to 19 in the late 1960s, essentially inflation, I'm looking at CPI here, that's the uh, Consumer Price Index, uh, basically peaked in the early 70s and then had another uh, ra- another movement of, of inflation into the late 70s. But then that was it. And a lot of that had to do with the end of the Cold War. We entered into a period of disinflation, basically starting in the early 1980s all the way through 
probably 2020. So let's call that 40 years of basically disinflation. So the average uh, European or, well, you're actually European, I, sh I should be careful because there's different, obviously very different countries, but let's call it Western European and certainly US investors have never really seen uh, a, 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 an, an, inf an inflationary environment, or at least not, they, not one they really remember, let's put it that way at least. Um, and that's a problem because we really think we're out of this 40 year period of disinflation, the disinflationary environment uh, was further uh, sort of uh, spurred by China entering the WTO in, I believe, uh, just the turn of, of the uh, of the century going into the year 2000. Um, and, and that continued up until basically COVID. And now we've got a new era. We have a geopolitical divides. We have, you know, global debt, uh, energy demand. I don't have time here to go through this whole dissertation, but it's a completely different world. Uh, and we really think that inflation in the U.S. is going to be closer to 3 to 5%, maybe even nor north of that um, for the next 5 to 10 years. And that is miles and miles and miles different from an inflation environment that's not even at 2, right? Like 1 to 2. Uh, it, it's going to be require a completely different asset allocation. In fact, and this is, this is maybe a touch of a stretch, but uh, because there's no... There's not a lot of data on this just yet, but this is interesting to watch. And I, I found this chart in full disclosure on Twitter. And basically this is uh, what, what I'm showing here or what I'm describing in case you can't see it, not a big deal. I'm sure I'm gonna talk about it right now. It's basically inflation for in the 1970s, which was high and there was two movements of inflation um, versus the 2020s. So basically, uh, basically now, and if I were to overlay that, we're basically right now almost exactly at the point where inflation could have another meaningful leg higher. And if that were to happen, not only will tech stocks do terribly bad, long duration assets, not because they're bad companies, but because of a high inflation environment and higher interest rate environment. Also on top of that, I should throw in this, throw this in there is the notion of uh, the debt load, right? I'm talking about the US debt load. So the more supply comes onto the market, the more the US has to refinance uh, the debt, which of course we have to, right? Um, the more we're going to have a supply and demand issue, meaning it's going to require higher yields, again higher interest rates, to to be able to absorb all that all that all that debt uh, issuance. So, uh, long story short, here as we as we now start off September and head into October again. Of course, we have an election in early November. I'm expecting a lot of news uh, and noise. We are really focusing on switching and making movements in portfolios, whether that's my own money or, uh, or, or mentioning this to our study trader clients or on the Blue Marlin advisor side, actually making those movements for our clients in a very specific uh, ETF focused portfolio that has a huge focus on, uh, on this inv inflationary environment that we're going to likely be in for, we think the next at least five, maybe more like 10 plus years could easily be 15 years. And again, you know, our focus here is on allocating these portfolios into, and this is important that I say portfolio away from tech stocks. And I don't mean like completely out of them, but taking down exposure meaningfully, because we think those stocks could meaningfully underperform. It could cause huge problems for portfolios. Everyone is dramatically overweight those stocks. And um, we believe now it's time to do that. So hopefully this was helpful for a bit of an update in terms of uh, how we see, we see things play out. Uh, again, there's the near term, as I mentioned before, as we had start off September, then maybe some seasonal weakness, uh, and then maybe a buying opportunity potentially just before or through or after the election. We, that remains to be seen. It's a bit too far away from here. Uh, and, but again, the big picture move uh, uh, takeaway here, and and we're, we're all over the map on this in terms of not all of that in terms of we're all over our clients on this explaining this this misallocation of capital right now in 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 way too much growth and particularly growth growth technology names, which we really think are going to underperform going forward. Remember, they've done spectacularly well for 15 years now. Um, and uh, and again, we're in a new, new era as, we're, as far as we're concerned. And uh, if you guys have any questions, please let us know. In the meantime, have a great start to September and we'll see you soon.